Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker and in this video we absolutely must talk about Robert Lucioni's morning worship talk which has just been released on JW.org. It has the theme Strengthen Your Spiritual Core and it's based on 2 Timothy 3 verse 13 which says but wicked men and impostors will advance from bad to worse misleading and being misled now spoiler alert <laughs> Robert Lucioni is going to argue that critics of Jehovah's Witnesses are the wicked men and impostors described in this verse but he's going to do it in quite an interesting and innovative way, which I haven't really heard done before, certainly not to the extent that he's doing it. You're going to see what I mean. Um, it's worth noting that this morning worship, based on the day's text, would have been filmed on October 4th, 2019. So it was filmed over a year ago, and JW.org has decided to release it now in November 2020. So just a bit of context there for you. We're now going to play the first clip. Uh, you think about the tactics that the wicked men and impostors used against Jesus and how this could have affected the apostles or affected us if we had been there. Uh, let's consider four tactics that they used against Jesus. Uh, number one, they used lies and misrepresentation. Uh, turn back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11, verse 9 is an example. Matthew eleven nineteen. excuse me. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, it says, The Son of Man did come eating and drinking, but people say, Look, a man who is a glutton, who's given to drinking wine, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, did Jesus like to eat and drink? Yes. Did he, in fact, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Yes. Uh, but do you know what the wicked men and imposters did? They stretched it to say, well, you see, because of that, he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You look at Luke chapter 15 and verse 2, he even kind of insinuates that he condones their behavior. Maybe even he shares in their sins. Well, what if you were there? Now, we know he liked to eat and drink, but I'm not with him 24 hours a day. I hope that's not true. Can you see how that could plant seeds of doubt, how it could rock somebody? A second tactic, wicked men and imposters would also twist Jesus' words. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 18 as an example. John chapter 5 and verse 18. And he says, this is why the Jews began seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making him equal to God. So here they uh, twist Jesus' words, saying that Jesus was saying he was equal to God. Jesus never said he was equal to God. He said that he was God's son. He says the father is greater than I am. But they constantly took Jesus' words, repackaged them, twisting them to make it sound like Jesus was off on his own. Now, what if you heard that story told and retold? You didn't hear the conversation, but you heard the story. You heard the sound bite. Wow, D did he really say that? Now, now th that would be out of line if he had, because nobody's equal to God. So hopefully you can see what I mean when I say that this is an interesting line of argument that Robert Lucioni is using. He's essentially pointing to Jesus and saying, look, people said bad things about Jesus, therefore, why should we be surprised if people say bad things about the governing body, about Jehovah's organization? Why should we be shaken in our faith when we hear negative things, when people were saying negative things about Jesus himself? Quite an interesting line of arguments, easily dismantled, as I'm going to demonstrate, nevertheless, an interesting line of argument that will work on many Jehovah's Witnesses who won't necessarily be able to think this through logically. I did find it interesting that Robert Lucioni cited that example of Jesus being accused of being a drunkard 
and a glutton. Again, bear in mind when this morning worship was given, October 4th, 2019. This was given six months after Bottlegate. And here you have a governing body helper saying, well, Jesus was accused of being a drunkard. If people could even point the finger at Jesus over his eating and his drinking, what on earth are they going to say about the faithful slave? It does seem a little bit like damage control. Bear in mind this is being given in front of the Bethel family, many of whom may have learned about Bottlegate because of I don't know, calls coming through to the headquarters from people who saw the video on YouTube. I, I just found that interesting. It did feel a little bit like damage limitation there. Anyway, let's proceed with the examples that Robert Lucioni is giving. Uh, wicked men and imposters would also inflame statements that people did not understand. Look at Luke, oh, excuse me, John chapter 6 and verse 54. You remember here when Jesus said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life and I will resurrect him in the last day. What was the reaction? You look at verse 60. When they heard this, many of the disciples said this speech is shocking. Who can listen to it? Verse 66, they went off to things behind and would no longer follow him. See, rather than giving it time to see if they understood it correctly, waiting to see if maybe Jesus clarified the statement, it knocked them. And you notice in verse 52, the Jews further stirred this up. And because of that, many stopped following him. It was too heavy for them to carry. Now, what if you were there and this time you heard Jesus say that? Whoa, man, that's odd. I, I don't think I can explain that teaching. He seems to be getting more and more extreme. Well, how did many react to these attacks? Well, the crowds, they love to follow Jesus. They love to hear his winsome words. No man's ever spoken like this. Thousands would come to be fed by him, to be healed by him. But in the end, most did not stick with Jesus. Why? Well, because when you strip all the other peripherals away, all the other extras away, it came down to their faith in Bible prophecy and that this man that was speaking to them was the Son of God. Their spiritual core was not strong enough. Now, Jesus' disciples had a strong spiritual core. See, even though they did get knocked down, they got confused at times, they stayed solid. They were able to get back up. Why? Because they recalled the Scriptures, and they were convinced that they were listening to the Son of God. Again, fascinating strategy, which I'm sure will work on many Jehovah's Witnesses, but what we're seeing here is Robert Lucioni conflate Jesus with the governing body. You just can't compare the, the way people follow Jesus and the reasons for people following Jesus with the way people follow the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and the reasons for following the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you take the Gospels at face value as a historical record, which, by the way, I'm not encouraging you to do, but for the sake of argument, if you believe everything that's said in the Gospels about Jesus people would have had every reason to stick with Jesus because he was giving them evidence that he was the Messiah. Jesus had far more interest in proving his theological claims, or at least the Jesus described in the Gospels had far more interest in proving his theological claims than the governing body are interested in proving their claims. And really, you can boil it down to two reasons that people would have for following Jesus. Number one, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And number two, the miracles that Jesus performed. Without those two things, all you have is some dude saying, I am the Messiah which anyone could say, and by the way, apparently lots of people were saying at that point in history 
um, in Palestine. What you needed was more than just words, you needed evidence. With the fulfillment of prophecy, it seems blindingly obvious that the gospel writers were doctoring the narrative to make it look like Jesus had fulfilled prophecies that he hadn't necessarily. A good example is Alma, the narrative of Jesus being born of a virgin. That seems to be a fairly good example of the gospel writers misinterpreting what was said in the Old Testament and then coming up with an outlandish story to try and connect all of the dots and make people believe. And in fact, when you're reading the Gospels, repeatedly you get the expression, Jesus did this so that the prophecy would be fulfilled. So the Gospel writers seemed acutely preoccupied with making sure that all of the credentials were there in terms of fulfilling prophecy. So you have the prophecy, you have the miracles, Again, miracles are something that you can just write into the story. There's no evidence of them happening. There's obviously no video footage or any way that we can independently corroborate that, for example, Jesus walked on water or fed the thousands with the loaves and fishes. It's just something where you have to take things at face value. But for the sake of argument... If you believe every word in the Gospels, people had every reason to follow Jesus based on, number one, miracles, and number two, the fulfilment of prophecy. Jesus himself seemed to appreciate the need for evidence and furnished miracles for that reason. So, for example, Luke 7, 22, in reply, he said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard, John the baptizer. The blind are now seeing, the lame are walking, the lepers are being cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised up, and the poor are being told the good news. So Jesus was asking followers of John the baptizer to go and report that all of these supernatural things were happening as evidence of his messiahship or in support of his theological claims john 4 verse 48 but jesus said to him unless you people see signs and wonders you will never believe he understood that people needed a bit more than words in order to accept his claims john 14 verse 11 believe me that i am in union with the father and the father is in union with me otherwise believe because of the works themselves in other words you could if you want just believe me based purely on what i'm telling you but if you can't just do that if you can't just believe what i'm telling you at least believe on the works at least believe on the miracles acts 2 verse 22 peter gives a speech in which he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man publicly shown to you by God through powerful works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Jesus understood the need for evidence. What evidence does the governing body give us that they were appointed as God's faithful slave invisibly by an invisible Jesus in 1919? Where is their evidence? How can we possibly corroborate that story? What they're giving us is just words. Believers based purely on what we're saying and don't question anything. Just believe us when we say that we are God's channel. We are God's appointed channel for disseminating divine truth. You cannot, Robert Lucioni, you cannot compare Jesus with the governing body when it comes to reasons for believing and reasons for following. Nice try, full marks for trying, but for those of us who have full control of our brains 
who have critical thinking skills, I'm afraid your arguments simply don't stand up. Well, today, wicked men and imposters use exactly the same techniques, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, they use lies and misrepresentation. They lie about how we deal with child abusers, how we care for the victims of child abuse. They twist statements that are made uh, regarding our stand on blood, loyalty to families, disfellowshipping. They capitalize on what they perceive as errors. Perhaps dogmatic statements we made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or, or understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. They also put a negative spin on changes that they do not understand. Say why we simplified, did reassignments in 2015, and new explanations of the generation, changes at world headquarters. What's the result? Well, some are swayed by these things. They're stumbled, they're knocked down. It's too heavy for them to carry. What an astonishing rant against apostates. Apparently, all we do is spread lies and misrepresentation. I feel like a broken record saying this <laughs> because I end up having to say the same thing time after time whenever they say stuff like this. Because let's face it, they're getting desperate now and apostates are clearly on their minds. They're, we would assume, seeing the impact of resources like this channel, of JW Survey, of Crisis of Conscience, of all of the many ways that you can learn the truth about the truth, they, they're they seeing the impact of that in their numbers, and they're getting desperate, and it shows. But here's the thing. If I'm lying, if I am misrepresenting anything, you will be able to find that out for yourselves, Jehovah's Witnesses. I am inviting you, pleading with you, to look at both sides of the argument. Is that what Robert Lucioni is doing? Ask yourselves honestly. Does he want you to see both sides of the argument and see for yourselves whether apostates are lying or not. Does he want you to put what we're saying to the test, to scrutinize our claims, to find out for yourselves whether they're lies and misrepresentation, or is he just ordering you to view what we're saying as lies and misrepresentation? Isn't that a bit patronizing? Isn't it a bit condescending to not dignify you, Jehovah's Witnesses, with the ability to figure these things out for yourselves. If I am lying, the evidence will be there. And having looked at what I'm saying, having examined my claims, my lies, and having established for yourselves that they are lies, your faith will be stronger than ever. So it's a win. If, on the other hand, you find out that they're not lies and they're not misrepresentations, you have the chance to break free. You have the chance to do something about it. Again, as I've said many times, it's a win-win. Robert Lucioni just is terrified of the idea, as is the rest of the organization, the governing body helpers, the governing body members, they are terrified at the thought of witnesses thinking for themselves and doing independent research into what the organization's been saying about child abuse, what its policies are, the way it treats victims, the way it breaks apart families, the way it drives people to utter desperation with its horrendously cruel shunning policy, the way this religion even claims lives through its blood teachings. Do the research for yourselves. Robert Lucioni certainly doesn't want you to do the research. And how fascinating that he speaks about dogmatic claims from the past. Let's hear that again. They capitalize on what they perceive as errors. 
Perhaps dogmatic statements we made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or, or understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. Are you seriously saying, are you admitting and confessing on behalf of the faithful slave, because this is supposedly spiritual food, did we just hear you confess that these were dogmatic claims? Because that's interesting. And perhaps for some context, we should listen to what Anthony Morris said back in 2015. If you refer to a belief or a system of beliefs as a dogma, you disapprove of it because people are expected to accept that it is true without questioning it. A dogmatic view uh, obviously is undesirable. And one other dictionary said, if, if you say someone is dogmatic, you are critical of them because they are convinced that they are right and refuse to consider that other opinions might also be justified. Well, I don't think uh, we would want to apply this to decisions that come out from the faithful slave in our time. Now, we have apostates and opposers that would like God's people to think that the faithful slave is dogmatic and they expect uh, you to accept everything that comes out from headquarters as if it's dogma, arbitrarily decided. Well, this does not apply and that's why it's properly translated decrees and in our day like Brother Cummers prayed and often the brothers do about decisions that will be made not just by the governing body but branch committees uh, this is a theocratic arrangement. Jehovah's blessing the faithful slave. So on the one hand, we have Robert Lucioni admitting that occasionally the organization has made dogmatic claims. Perhaps dogmatic statements we made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or, or understanding of the time of the end. And on the other hand, you have Tony Morris back in 2015 saying that the faithful slave would never say anything or teach anything that's dogmatic. I don't think uh, we would want to apply this to decisions that come out from the faithful slave. Dogma, arbitrarily decided. Well, this does not apply. Which one are we supposed to believe? <laughs> Those are two clearly conflicting statements. So again, fascinating. Well done, Robert Lucioni for at least admitting that dogmatic things have been said, especially about Armageddon, especially about the end times. And again, we apostates, and I'm not ashamed of the word apostate, by the way, because an apostate is merely someone who leaves their religion, according to the dictionary. And I think that if you find out that your religion is false or even abusive, and you're in a position to leave, you have a moral duty to leave. So I'm not ashamed of the word apostate. I do take issue with being called wicked by an organisation that covers up child abuse and keeps the worst of humanity from being processed by the legal system. I think that is more than just wicked. That's an abomination. That is knowingly putting children at risk, Robert Lucioni, Anthony Morris, the rest of the governing body members and helpers are part of that machinery and they have the gall to point the finger at people like me and say that we're wicked just for exposing them, just for giving people the ability to see both sides of the argument and reach an informed, educated decision. But yes, when it comes to uh, claims about Armageddon and Armageddon predictions. I've made a video about them. They're there in the literature. It cannot be denied that this organization has made very dogmatic claims about the end of the world. They've done this in Jehovah's name as his witnesses. And what do we find at Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 to 22? If any prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name that I did not command him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. However you may say in your heart, how will we know that Jehovah has not spoken the word? 
when the prophet speaks in the name of Jehovah and the word is not fulfilled or does not come true, then Jehovah did not speak that word. The prophet spoke it presumptuously. You should not fear him. This just describes the history of this organization. 140 years of getting it wrong. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you need to ask yourselves, if they got it wrong in the past, what's to stop them getting it wrong now? Imagine, imagine you were a Bible student in 1925 and Joseph Rutherford saying that Armageddon's going to come by that year. Can you imagine people saying at that time, well, didn't Charles Taze Russell say that Armageddon would come by 1914 and it didn't happen? Why should we believe that it's now going to happen in 1925? And you're going to be making all sorts of excuses to say, ah, oh, yes, but uh, Brother Russell didn't have the full understanding of God's word. Brother Rutherford now has this understanding and he's telling us it's going to happen in 1925. So with full faith in God's approved channel, we'll stick to that year. And 1925 comes and goes. 1975. Can you imagine people saying, well, the organization said things about 1914 and 1925. How are we supposed to know that 1975 is going to be any different? A Jehovah's Witness at that time would say, ah, yes, but the light's getting brighter. The slave today has so much more knowledge of the scriptures. And if they're saying that this is going to be a year of significance, then we should follow what they're saying. 1975, again, comes and goes. You can say the same thing about the generation teaching. This is just an organization that habitually, habitually gets it wrong about Armageddon for the simple reason that it's a man-made religion that is not being steered by God or by any form of almighty supernatural deity. There's just no evidence there at all. Again, the governing body doesn't even try to give evidence to support their claims to being God's channel. They just ask you to believe. They just ask you to have faith. How about us? How strong is our spiritual core? See, that's why we hear repeatedly that we must personally have a regular, deep study of the scriptures. That's why we're reminded repeatedly that Jehovah is using the governing body to give us the good things that we have. Now, why is that so important? Well, because one day we may hit a time whether personally, in our personal life, or as an organization, when all the other spiritual peripherals are gone, all the extras, what do we do then? Uh, what do we do, for example, if the lights go out on broadcasting? Uh, what happens perhaps when we, we don't have the incredible conventions, the uh, touching videos, the catchy music, the beautifully written, well-written Watchtower articles, the exciting annual meetings, they're gone. See, some of our brothers and sisters do not have access to those things right now. We well, see, at that time, it will come down to our faith that this is God's word, and the governing body is the channel that Jehovah has been using. So during this period of relative calm, may we follow the advice of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Know the holy writings inside and out, and remember from whom we've learned all the good things that we know. That's our spiritual core. Strengthen it, maintain it, it will stabilize us, and it will help us to get through the things that are yet to come. He's just browbeating Jehovah's Witnesses into submission here. And it's going to work. It really is going to work. I've been a witness. I know how this sort of talk would send shivers down my spine but again in the context of an organization that is so obviously unraveling in the internet age because it can no longer monopolize information as it did before the internet when they could just print 
whatever they wanted and it was very hard to fact check what they were saying the internet's killing them and their answer is to just keep on screaming don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain ignore what the critics are saying they're all lying don't see for yourselves whether they're lying don't see for yourselves whether they're trying to twist statements that by the way stung <laughs> if you've been if you've been watching my hate speech series, uh, CCJW, the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK, wrote a nine-page dossier against me, trying to get me thrown off an investigation, uh, the ICSA investigation in England and Wales, on the basis of hate speech. If you want to see a masterclass in twisting statements... Look at that nine-page dossier, which I'm going through in the hate speech series. They are masters when it comes to that. But again, their modus operandi is to just simply gaslight people into not checking things for themselves. Make them feel as though they'd be crazy if they were to try to apply any kind of critical thinking or any kind of analytical process to the claims being made by critics. It's astonishing. And again, it will work in many cases. But this is what we're up against. In a way, it's nice to see this organisation so obviously reeling at uh, people leaving, at people waking up and doing whatever they can to silence the apostates and to scare people into not listening to what apostates have to say. So those were my thoughts on Robert Lucioni's morning worship. I hope you found this video interesting. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.